but who is world renowned for her advocacy on uh, human rights issues in China. You all have in your program her, her biography, and um, rather than I just read the, the bio, um, maybe just say a couple words about why I thought it was particularly important that we have Mislin speak tonight. Um, many of us who are here, who grew up here, who have families here, um, not that we don't uh, sacrifice in the context of, of the advocacy we do for human rights, but it's relatively easy for us to stand up and talk about these, these issues. Um, and sometimes we get acknowledged and appreciated for the advocacy that we do. But there are people around the world and there are people here in this country who pay a great price for the advocacy that they do, who stand up uh, and who count the cost and pay it anyways. Um, Ms. Lin grew up in China. She has family in China uh, that are targeted by the Chinese government because of her advocacy. Uh, she is not able uh, to travel to the country of her birth because of her advocacy. Uh, and, and yet, she courageously speaks out over and over again about uh, these, these issues of religious freedom and abuse of human rights. Uh, and uh, because of her involvement in, uh, in, in Miss World Canada, she's, uh, she's got a platform to raise these issues. Uh, and it's striking how terrified the Chinese government is of her, and it speaks to her effectiveness at getting her message out. So with that, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Anastasia Lin to share with us. Growing up in an atheist country, the idea of belief was foreign to me. China's 5,000 years of half divine culture, divine culture, that respect human dignity and kindness, had been reduced to political slogans in the past few decades. Now, I had a one-of-a-kind tiger mom that brought me to an ancient academy and made me copy what was left of our culture's essence on the wall. But still, I always had a problem understanding what belief is and why is it important? Why would the follower of Jesus Christ sacrifice their lives to stay true to their devotion? Or why would Socrates drink the poison instead of taking the chance to escape with Kirtle? And these ideas and thoughts would all come find me in the years to come. When I moved to Canada when I was 13 years old, I spent a few years adjusting my worldview, observing people's different form of activism some effective, some less so. But still, I couldn't really understand what motivated these people to go out there and change the world. Then I moved to Toronto when I was 18 years old to study. Sort of. And I was enrolled in theater school and inspired to become a great actress. I was inexperienced didn't have much to my resume, and would jump on any opportunity to be in front of the camera to practice my craft. And this independent Chinese producer approached me to act in his TV series, an episode which tackles the Sutran earthquake. I don't know how many of you here knows about the Sutran earthquake, the tragedy. Many children died in the earthquake because of the underqualified constructions, and that was because of communist corruption. Is this topic sensitive enough that any actor from China would know that the opportunity cost may be future access to the entire mainland China. Artists who produce controversial works often experience censor censorship in one form or another. I will raise a good example of that. Knowing all this, I still chose to do it because I wanted to be an actress so bad. And fate had brought me on a journey with no real option of turning back since then. A couple years ago, when I was on set of The Bleeding Edge, I interviewed victims from China who were persecuted for their beliefs. And because the script was based on real victims' testimony, there were a lot of torture scenes. I had to learn the physicality of these experiences of being tortured, what it felt like to have bamboo stick 
punctured into your fingernails. Electronic baton, shocking to different parts of the body, private parts, or the head. Um, I had to learn what it feels like to have 20 different kinds of electronic baton shocking you at the same time for hours, man. So I spoke to a lot of these victims that our director, Li Li, brought to set to help me. And among them were the sisters Jin Tian and Jin Cai. So all four of her, their family members were persecuted because they practiced Falun Gong. And both of the sisters were sentenced 13 years in prison. They've gone on hunger strike, like many other political prisoners in China, to protest their persecution. And the, with the longest, Jin Cai, Jin Tian has been on hunger strike for 50 days. Because they were sisters, the police forced them to watch each other being force fed. That means having a thick plastic tube sticking from the nostril all the way down to your, um, to your stomach. And if they inserted it in the wrong place, into their lungs, they die instantly. Both of them were persecuted to the verge of losing their lives. And fearing responsibility for their lives, the police released them on medical parole. CBC recently produced, um, a, broadcasted a documentary about their story called Avenues of Escape. Jin Cai told me what it felt like to have the electronic button being shot to the head. It feels like a truck crushing into one's skull. But I wonder what made her, what got her through all that. All these torture were made to aim for transformation. It is a psychological reprogramming that, that is aimed to make one renounce one's belief. Christians have been through this. Falun Gong practitioners have been through this. And with the, China, uh, the cultural genocide going on in Tibet and Uyghur, I don't know how many more people have gone through this. Some of the labor camp was the transformation rate of 90%. That's what Jin Tsai told me. I will believe her, the 90%. From what they described to me, most of the people probably would have given up by then. What I didn't believe was the 10%. The 10% of people like Jin Tian and Jin Cai. They had this inner power. It's not just that they survived. They survived all this and maintained the belief that the world is good. Despite being surrounded by fear, evil, and despair, yet, they still choose to believe that the world is composed of truth, kindness, and forgiveness. And they came out and passed on the light to everyone around them. Although in this Western society, we are in a free society, their voices are often not heard. You see them on the street of Chinatown handing out flyers. But how many people pass them in haste and ignoring what is in their hands? That is the story of their lives. And that's why I chose to run for Miss World Canada. Later on in my journey, their image often come to mind. I think of them when I find myself in the darkness. After I won Miss World Canada, my family went under great pressure from the regime in an effort to keep me silenced. When my father sent me a text message pleading me, with me to leave them a way to survive in China, I, f I felt I was broken. I wanted to give up. And it's really wonderful to stand here finally in Canadian Parliament to talk about this. Believe it or not, this is the first time I had the opportunity to speak in Ottawa after two years of this happening. And I wanted to give up, but then their image came to mind, and I was reminded of the possibility that they showed me when one stays true to oneself. I wondered what if I ignore what my fears tell me, 
what if I take a leap of faith, trusting my heart, and just take life as it comes? And the rest is history. In many parts of the world, governments and forces of intolerance tend to take away people's right to belief, to strip people bare of any source of inner power. They censor the art, they silence the media, also to make it more easy to enslave the people. They might succeed for a while, arresting human rights lawyers and believers, banning books and films and blocking websites, but they can never censor the human spirit. They can never take away the power, the imagination, the spirit of creativity, the hope, and the faith that's in us. They can never take away the human spirit. And I know this from experience. It's really wonderful that we're all coming together here today. And I feel very supported in this environment. Um, the world today is crying out for hope. And we can all do this. Do our part in inspiring hope. As actors, through our film and plays, as writers, through our books and articles, and parliamentarians, through staying true to our values and voicing our beliefs, and members of the media, through spreading the word and informing the public. I want to end by quoting one of my favorite quotes. Um, this one is from the former chief rabbi of United Kingdom, Jonathan Sachs, the author of several extraordinary books. He wrote this. Against the fundamentalism of hate, we must create a counter-fundamentalism of love. A little light, set the Jewish mystics, drives away much darkness. And when light is joined to light, mine to yours and yours to others, the dance of, the dance of flames, each so small, yet together so intricately beautiful, It shows that world, that hope is not an illusion, and that evil, injustice, cruelty, and oppression do not have the final word. I'm sorry I'm getting emotional, but this is my first opportunity to speak in Ottawa, and I'm feeling it deeply in my soul right now. Thank you very much. open to taking a, a few questions that people want to get up to the mic and, and ask.